Hey everybody, it's Dr. Rex again. Uh, today we're gonna get into dynamic equilibrium, vapor pressure curves, and the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. So let's get into our PowerPoint slides. Here we go, vapor pressure, which is where we left off before. We had our handy dandy water bottle and we talked about how there's a certain level of liquid in here and of course, some amount of that liquid water is gonna evaporate, become vapor, and we're gonna have some specific amount of pressure in here. And that vapor pressure is gonna be specific for water at a certain temperature, and it's gonna be specific and different if this were alcohol or gasoline or something else. Dynamic equilibrium is when we have, when equilibrium is when two things are balanced. So if we have a teeter-totter, we have a kid on each side and they weigh the same, and the teeter-totter is in equilibrium. That's a static equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is when we actually have constant small changes or motions, but the substance itself stays at equilibrium. So this nice example here, we have this Erlenmeyer flask, this is sealed, we have water in here, and with the point, at the initial point, we have zero water vapor. So the only thing that's gonna happen is evaporation. So the rate of evaporation will be very, very, very high. But as we start to get water vapor in here, some percentage of those molecules will not have enough kinetic energy, they will condense back into a liquid. So we'll have a rate of condensation. At some point, Maybe after some of the water has evaporated, the liquid level has gone down a little bit. At some point, the rate of evaporation will be equal to the rate of condensation. When this happens, when the water level here is no longer changing, we are in dynamic equilibrium. And why is it dynamic? Again, because even though we may not be able to see it, there's actually constant motion in here. The overall number of water molecules that are liquid isn't changing neither is the number that are vapor. But those specific molecules that are vapor is changing because some of them are condensing and becoming liquid again, and some of this liquid is evaporating. So it's a dynamic equilibrium. There are certain things we could do to change that. So we have this nice example here with these pistons and the cylinder, and we can move the piston up and down. So we have some hydrocarbon here, let's say pentane, and we have a liquid and some amount of it is gonna evaporate. And as it does, we have vapor, and we have vapor pressure from that gas bouncing off the walls of the container. Well, if we bring that piston up like we have here in B, we can see that initially the vapor pressure is gonna go down because now we have a larger space, we have the same number of vapor molecules, we're gonna get less collisions, we're gonna have a lower vapor. What's gonna happen? Well, more of that substance is gonna evaporate until the vapor pressure increases and becomes equal to the vapor pressure that we had over here. Or we can do the opposite. We can push that piston down. We can decrease the area, in which case we're temporarily going to get a spike in pressure. And what's gonna happen? More of those gas molecules are gonna condense. We're gonna have less vapor at some point until the vapor pressure in C is equal to the vapor pressure in A. So what does that tell us about dynamic equilibrium? Well, if we make changes to the conditions, if we change the pressure or the temperature or the number of molecules or what they are, we're gonna see a shift in the system until that equilibrium is established again. So, it's very difficult, especially um, depending on your setup or most lab setups, to make large changes in the volume um, or the amount that we have of something. It's much easier to change the temperature. It's very difficult for me to change the volume of my kitchen. It's very easy for me to change the temperature or I can't really change the volume of my oven, right? I can easily change the temperature though. Same thing in a lab. If we're using a hot plate or a Bunsen burner, we can easily change the temperature. So what happens as we do that? Well, as the temperature increases, we're increasing the kinetic energy. A larger percentage of those molecules are gonna be able to enter into the vapor phase or the gas phase. And what's gonna happen? Vapor pressure is gonna increase. Decrease the temperature, vapor pressure decreases. Of course, we can plot this out and we have. Scientists have gone out, they've taken a specific substance, and they'll record the temperature over multiple different temperatures and the resulting pressure, and they'll get this thing here, which is called a vapor pressure curve. We have our vapor pressure, in this case, in millimeters of mercury on our axes here on the left. That's the exact same thing as Tor. We could convert it to atmospheres or something else if we wanted. And we have our temperature here in Celsius on the bottom. Each one of these different colored curves represents a different substance. So that will tell us at a specific temperature, let's say we're talking about the titanium four chloride at 70 degrees, what would we expect 
the vapor pressure for that substance to be? Or at 50 degrees, what would we expect the vapor pressure of ethanol to be? So you're not gonna have to make any of these curves yourself, but you should know what they look like, you should know what they tell you, and you should know how to read one. Now, here's the other thing. Normal atmospheric pressure is 760 torr, 760 millimeters of mercury, or one atmosphere. When the vapor pressure, that atmosphere is going to be pushing essentially against our liquid, when the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure or the push from the atmosphere, what's going to happen? That substance is going to boil. And now we can freely enter into the vapor phase. So if we draw that green line across here at one atmosphere, normal atmospheric pressure, that should actually be the boiling point for each of these substances. Let's go over here to water. Let's look where that green line intersects and let's follow that down and boom, there it is, 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water. So this actually allows us to see what all the boiling points of these substances are and test is that vapor pressure curve accurate. The other thing we could do is say we were hanging out on Mount Everest because that's what we do because we get bored and we can just easily get up there and we're going to cook some macaroni and cheese and we want to know what is the vapor pressure there? What is the temperature that this water is going to boil at? So we could do a different line if we wanted. Maybe say look at that substance at a much lower pressure, 500 millimeters of mercury and see what's the boiling point there going to be. So a lot of things, a lot of information we can get from that vapor pressure curve. How are you going to see this as a question? Something like this. Which of the following is the most volatile? Volatile means weak intermolecular forces should be the lowest boiling point. Should be the substance the furthest to the left. And it is, there it is, ether, that light purple vapor pressure curve line right there. Which of the following is the strongest intermolecular attractions? So very strong intermolecular attractions, very non-volatile, very high boiling point. Well, that's going to be the one all the way to the right, the blue line there, the titanium-4 chloride. Talked about boiling point again. Like I said, you can read through that slide. What does it mean? Why is the boiling point what it is in re uh, relation to the atmospheric pressure? And this, another table here, you don't have to memorize it, but it illustrates this point very nicely. Here is several different elevations. So if we're right around sea level, like we are in Florida, our atmospheric pressure should be right around one atmosphere. And we can see the boiling point of water would be about 100 degrees. And this is why in places like Colorado, it actually takes longer to make macaroni and cheese or spaghetti. Because here, when we're cooking our noodles, we're doing it at 100 degrees when the water is boiling. But over there at a higher elevation, when their water is boiling, they're only cooking their noodles at 94 degrees. Which of the following has the highest normal boiling point? So again, strongest intermolecular attractive forces, highest boiling point, we draw that green line across, should be the line furthest to the right. There it is, the TiCl4 again. This brings us to the clausius clapeyron equation. You'll notice that all of these are curves, they're exponential curves. And here's the thing, scientists are incredibly lazy. We like straight lines because they're easier to work with. The equation of the line is much simpler. Look at that. Wait, here it comes, maybe not. There it is. There's the equation for that line that we just saw. I don't know about you, looks a little bit scary to me. So what we wanna do is see how can we turn this into a straight line instead of that exponential curved line. So don't have to worry about this math. If you love math, you can go through, but this is the manipulation they're gonna to do to that original equation to get it to the equation of a straight line. And all you need to worry about is that bottom equation right there. And some of you can probably see it, and some of you might not be able to, but this is actually the equation for a straight line. There's my y, my m, my x, and my b. y equals mx plus b. So here's my slope, and you can see now what we have to plot to get a straight line. So instead of plotting pressure and temperature, if we plot the natural log of pressure and the inverse of the temperature, and we get all our data points, we'll get a nice straight line. And if you go back to here, you'll notice that the slope of that straight line is the negative heat of vaporization over R. So if we can find the slope, we can find the enthalpy of vaporization. So what is that gonna look like? You won't have to make any of these. Again, you will not have to make any of these graphs, but you should know what they look like and you should know how to use them. So they're gonna get a bunch of temperature and pressure data. They're gonna convert their temperatures. They're gonna take one divided by that, get their inverse temperature. They're gonna take the natural log of their pressure and get that there. They're gonna plot those points on their graph. There's all the data points. Now we fit a nice straight line to those. You can do that in Excel, plot uh, or fit linear trend line or an origin. 
and they get the equation of their line. And this wants to know, what is the heat of vaporization of dichloromethane? Well, once we know the slope, we can figure that out. So they're going to take that slope, that negative 3,776, but they're going to be extra lazy. They're just going to approximate it to negative 3,800. And they know that that is equal to the negative enthalpy vaporization over R. So if they multiply by negative R, they'll get their enthalpy vaporization. Now, R is the ideal gas constant. You're probably used to seeing that as 0 0.08206, but that has units of liters atmospheres over mole Kelvin. Well, now we're dealing with energy. So we're going to use the ideal constant with energy units, 8.314, and this is in joules. Now, what did we do? We made this even more difficult, so you could be extra frustrated and sad. You'll notice that enthalpy of vaporization is typically in kilojoules, and this is in joules. So after you multiply your slope by negative r, you're going to have your enthalpy vaporization or your heat of vaporization in joules per mole. Make sure you convert to kilojoules. If we don't have a whole bunch of data, we didn't get it or somebody didn't get it for us and we can't make that plot, we can use this two-point form of the clausius clapeyron equation. So if I know the substance and I have two different temperatures and I know one of the pressures, I can find the other pressure. Or if I know two of the pressures and one of the temperatures, I can find the other temperature. What we have here, if you look actually, is five variables, our two pressures, our two temperatures, and our enthalpy of vaporization. If we know any four, there it is, of those variables, we can solve for the other one. So if I know the enthalpy vaporization, two of my temperatures and one of my pressures, I can find the other pressure. Or if I know both of my pressures and both of my temperatures, I can find the enthalpy of vaporization. What does this look like? All right, calculate the vapor pressure of methanol at 12 degrees C. So it looks like initially we only have one of the variables, but that's not true if we dig just a little bit, just a little bit. They told us it's methanol, so right up there in the bat, we can go look up the boiling point of methanol. So now we have our second temperature. Well, we know that our boiling point is at standard temperature and pressure, and that's 764, so we have one of our pressures. And we can go to our table for enthalpies of vaporization, and we can actually find that for methanol as well. So it turns out we do have four of our variables. The only one we don't have is the pressure P2 at that 12 degrees Celsius, and now we can solve for that. So we're gonna take our other four variables, we're gonna take our clausius clapeyron two-point equation, and we're gonna plug everything in. Since the temperature units in R are in Kelvin, we have to convert our temperatures here into Kelvin. So we're gonna do that right there. Now we've got all our values, we can plug them right into our equation. It doesn't matter what you make, T1 or P1 or T2, just so long as you keep the pressure with its corresponding temperature. So if this is the pressure for the boiling point of methanol and that's P1, I have to make that T1. If I made the boiling point pressure P2, then I would make the boiling point temperature T2. I plug these values in, you'll notice now joules are they converted the enthalpy vaporization from kilojoules mole to joules per mole. So joules, moles, Kelvin, they're all going to cancel. They're going to bring me to that negative 2.31. But we have a little problem. I don't have both the values here. How do I take the natural log of this if one of these is a variable? Well, what I'm going to do is take and raise E to both sides. So I'm going to take E raised to the natural log of P2 over P1 and E raised to the negative 2.31. What is E? It's essentially the anti-natural log. So if you go to your calculator, hopefully you probably have one Similar to that, I really like these guys. They're cheap, they're non-programmable. Uh, people leave them laying around all the time. So if you comb the library, not right now, but someday, you can usually find these uh, for free. So I'm gonna take that 2.31 that they gave us. 2.3, oops, keep doing that. 2.31, and I'm gonna make that negative. And then I wanna take E raised to that. So there's my E right above the natural log. It's shifted, so I need to shift and E, that gets me that 0 0.0993, which is what they have here, and that's how they got that value. And when they took E raised to the natural log, they canceled each other out. So now we have really nice variable over 760 equals another value, multiply both sides by 760, and we have P2 equaling 75.44. And it makes sense, it is a noticeably lower pressure than what we had at the boiling point. And since we're at a notice, noticeably lower temperature, that is what we would expect. 
All right, one more we're going to work through on our own on this tablet, um, and then we'll be all done here. And hopefully you're still with me. Determine the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees C. So very similar to the problem we had before. So we have water. We are told, um, let's say our T1 was 25 degrees C, or that's going to be 298 Kelvin. We're told water, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to find our other value as our boiling point. So for water, that's 100 degrees C or 373 Kelvin. We can find, or we are from the table, I think we were given the enthalpy of vaporization, which is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. And we know the pressure associated with this, since we made that Boiling point temperature T2, its corresponding pressure is going to have to be P2. So there we go. So now we can plug all these into our equation. So we have the natural log of P2 over P1 equals convert my enthalpy of vaporization into joules, no longer in kilojoules, and then my ideal gas constant here. And one over T2, which is that 373 minus one over T1, which was our 298. And this gets us 2 there. Multiply those through. And take E raised to that there, E raised to that there. This cancels and we have 760 over P1 equals 27.113. So P1 equals 760 divided by that is about 28 torr. Same thing, makes sense. Water is not very volatile. We're at a temperature well below the boiling point. So we should see a pressure well below the pressure at the boiling point. Uh, again, hopefully this was helpful. Please give me feedback. Let me know otherwise. I'll see you on the next video. Au revoir.